comes to life. Fears turn to faith. I'm really excited uh, for these next three, four weeks uh, as we hear from God's word and how God begins to move some things in our lives. And I found that a lot of us are stuck. We're stuck in fear. We're stuck in worry. We're stuck in anxiety. And I believe the way to combat those things is through trust and trusting in one person. And so today we're going to talk about moving from fear, anxiety, worry, to trust. And when I was uh, in college, I worked at some summer camps. I don't know if you guys ever did anything like this, but I was working at the summer camp. And they do something at summer camps that are called trust falls. You ever heard of one of these? So you do stuff like you stand up on a high spot, like on top of a picnic table, and it's a team building exercise, right? And then the team is supposed to stand below you, and they all connect arms, and then you fall backwards, and they catch you. How many have ever done one of these trust fall exercises? Okay, a, fool, a few of you foolish people in here. No, I'm just kidding. I've done, one, I've done these as well. And so I was at the summer camp, and I was leading this uh, team exercise portion, and it was a trust fall segment. And so, um, you know, everyone was doing it one after the other, standing on top of the picnic table, falling backwards. The whole team had their arms linked. They would catch them. It was this, you know, it was a cool moment for the team to trust one another. But as I was watching this and I was facilitating this, this one girl got up there, And she, you know, without hesitation, without fear, decided to trust fall backwards, but the team wasn't quite ready. They weren't paying attention. And she just literally got up there, and usually you count down, and she was like, I think she was just scared, and so she just got up there and just quickly fell backwards. And I'm like, no! Right, it was like slow motion. I'm watching her fall, and all these students are laughing and giggling as she's falling through the middle of them. And she falls and realizes, you know, like halfway down, it doesn't feel like they're catching me. And she kind of turns and puts her arms down, hits the ground, and she just starts screaming. And we rush her to the nurse who then takes her to the doctor, and she had broken her arm in a trust fall exercise (laughs) that I was overseeing. (laughs) Talk about your epic fail. But here's the thing. I want to talk to you about trust and trusting God today. And I think that this is something you hear in the church. Yeah, trust God, right? Trust Him with your life. Trust Him with your relationships. Trust Him with your your job. Trust Him with your finances. Trust God. But I think a lot of us say it with our words, but we don't live it with our lives. And so I want to talk to us about how we need to move today. And I think a lot of people are stuck in fear. They're stuck in worry. They're stuck in anxiety. Anxiety. Too many of us in this world, in this culture, But we need to be a people that trust in our God. So I want to ask you a question today. And it's this question that I want you to think about. But it's this. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? Because what I found is that in a lot of situations, there's nothing we can do. Relationally, we may be in a marriage And none of us want to, you know, get divorced. Neither of us want to get divorced. But also neither of us wants to change. And so we're stuck. And there's, it feels like there's nothing we can do. What do we do when there's nothing we can do? Maybe it's financially. Maybe you made a bad financial decision. Maybe you've had just a tough luck within your financial situation of your life. You have student loans. You have debt up to here. And you feel like, God, what do I do? There's nothing I can do in this moment. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? Maybe it's professionally. You had that, that dream job and you made a mistake. You messed up. Maybe you lost your job. 
Maybe you've been blocked from having a job similar to that. And so in, as it relates to your occupation professionally, you feel like there's nothing you can do. Your health. You know, a lot of you out there, you eat green, right? You, you eat organic. We're the farm to fork capital of, of America, they say. I don't know if that's true, but that's what they say here in Sacramento. Um, a lot of you, you don't eat meat. You vegans out there. Um, I feel for you, but it's all good. And, uh, you know, you think, oh, I, I'm going to manage my health well, but there comes a point where you, lose, you don't have control and maybe you get cancer. What do you do? There's nothing you can do. Maybe it's even your academics. You've come to a place in your academics where you feel like you've failed. Uh, you've gone as far as you can. You can't get past where you are. It seems like there's nothing you can do. So I think that what we end up feeling is we feel like really three things. When we come to this place where there's nothing that we can do. Number one, we feel like we'll never be happy again. Number two, we feel like nothing good can come from this. And number three, we feel like there's no point in continuing. And I think that this is what happens when fear and anxiety and worry enter into our lives, when we're in situations where it feels like there's nothing we can do. And I want to read from Psalm chapter 27. And David here is, he writes this psalm, and he's going through it. In this moment, uh, most theologians would agree that David in this moment, that it was when he was running from Saul. Saul was pursuing him. David had done nothing but serve the king, serve King Saul. He killed Goliath for King Saul. He fought, you know, other armies for King Saul. He'd served King Saul. He even played his heart for King Saul to make him feel better. Um, David had done nothing but serve his king, and yet his king had become so consumed with his own fear and his own anxiety, his own worry, that he wanted nothing more than to kill David, to wipe him out from the planet Earth. And this is when David pens this psalm. You see, he's on the run. He's hiding in caves. He's constantly moving from place to place because everywhere he goes, the armies of Saul are pursuing him. Saul himself is pursuing him. And David is in this moment where it feels like there's nothing he can do. What do you do? You've done everything right. And yet still, the enemy is up against you. And I think some of you are in here and you feel like David. You're going, Caleb, I've done everything right. I've done everything God's asked of me, and yet it still it feels like I'm under attack, like the enemies are against me, and constantly I'm just being filled up with fear, with anxiety, with worry, maybe even with anger, with frustration towards God. But I believe God wants to move us to trust. And David gives us a great example here of being in a tough situation where there's really nothing he can do, and yet still he says, I will trust in God. So let's read. I'm going to read uh, this entire psalm. It's 14 verses, so stick with me. Follow along. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation, for my father and my mother have forsaken me. Maybe some of you feel like that. But the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Jesus, speak to us today from your word. We thank you for it. 
in your name. Amen. So David is experiencing the fear that comes from a tough situation. The anxiety, the worry that comes when it seems like there's nothing he can do. And so that was the question I wanted to ask you. I want you to ask yourselves, what do I do when there's nothing I can do? And while it may seem like there's nothing you can do to fix the situation, there's always something you can do to shift your perspective. And so today, we're going to look at this idea of trusting in our God. Because that's the shift in our perspective we have to make. While there may be nothing we can do in this situation, we can shift our perspective and say, I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to live in fear. I'm not going to live in anxiety any longer. I'm simply going to trust in God, as David said over and over. So the real question, the real question I think probably some of you have asked, and maybe you're asking here today, and you came in this place asking this question is, Does God know what's happening in my life? Does God see what's happening in my life? And and does God care about what's happening in my life? And some of you have gone through situations or you're in situations and you've asked that question because it feels like God is absent. It feels like God is not there. And I'm here to tell you the good news that we see in Scripture and that we as Christians can hold on to is is that this, He does care. He does know, and he does see your situation. The good news for those of you who aren't Christians in this place, we're so glad you're here, is this. God does know. He does see you in your situation, and he does care. I'm here to tell you that. So I want you to understand today that God is not absent. I think a lot of people begin to think that God is absent when he doesn't act immediately in the situation when they go through a tough time. God is not absent apathetic. Some of us begin to think that God, he has apathy towards us or towards our situation. And the last thing is that God is not angry. God is not angry at you. That's not why you're going through the situation you've gone through. He's not this angry God in heaven just looking to crush you, to strike you with a lightning bolt, which I think that's how I grew up in the church at times, feeling that that's the God that I served was. No, he's not absent. He's not apathetic. He's not angry. But his timing and his pur- purpose in our situation may not be what we think it is. And that's why we have to trust him. So how do we move from fear, anxiety, worry to trust? Number one, we need to place our trust in God alone. In him alone. You know, a lot of us are guilty of putting our trust in different things, aren't we? We put our trust in a relationship. We put our trust in our finances. We put our trust in things. We put our trust in our job. We put our trust in our own strength and ability. How powerful we are. But David, he, he, he penned something so powerful here when he says, The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He's the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? No matter who comes against me, my enemies, my foes, they're the ones that are going to stumble and fall. And I love this because I think so often we put our trust in all the wrong things. Some of you are putting your trust in politicians right now. Oh my goodness, don't even get me started on that. Like seriously, we don't talk about politics up in church, but um, I just, I don't even know what to do at this point, guys. Like seriously, we just just need to pray, man. Pray that Jesus comes down in this next year because I can't handle it. I cannot handle another 12 months of this, people. Okay. Anyways, we got a little less than 12, 12 months, I guess. But I want you to understand that David is not a wuss. Okay, hear me. This is the teenage boy that took down a giant that no one else would face. And he says, oh, I'll go face him because God's on my side. The teenage boy that ripped apart a bear with his bare hands, that killed a lion with his own hands. This is no wuss. And yet here in this moment, he's on the run. Not only that, but he has a bunch of mighty men around him, but they're running, they're hiding in caves, they're running from the the army, from Saul's army. He has this little horde of great fighters with him, the greatest fighters in Israel. And yet still, what does he say? He doesn't say, these dudes with me are my stronghold. He doesn't say, these mighty men that have my back are my defense. He doesn't say, my strength, you know, I killed Goliath. 
I took out a lion. I took out a bear. He doesn't say, I got this. I'm the baddest dude on the planet, which he could have said, right? What does he say? He says, the Lord is my stronghold. The Lord is my defense. It's not him. It's his God. We got to place our trust in God alone. Now, this is a time of fear that David is experiencing. And I think we got to understand and be, re and be realistic and honest with our feelings. Because God is not thrown off by your emotions. You, you realize that. Like, he understands you're human. He understands you're going to have worry. You're going to be anxious at times. You're going to have fear in moments. And I think that the reality is we, we preach it, and I've taught it. We did a whole series a few months back called Fearless. And one thing I said is, look, it's not the absence of fear that I think God is looking for completely in our lives. He's looking for the, the complete ability to trust him in the midst of our fear. And David's saying, look, uh, he wouldn't be saying over and over of whom shall I be afraid if he wasn't experiencing fear. He was experiencing fear and he's saying that's why I'm going to trust in God. That's why I'm going to speak it out that God is my defense. That God is my stronghold. That God has my back. We have to trust in who God is, not what we need. Because too often, all we do is we think of God as this lucky rabbit's foot, right? If we just rub it enough, this rabbit's foot, then, then we'll be good. Or we think of God as an ATM machine, and we just send up our prayers, and he dishes it out. Whatever we need, it doesn't work that way. We have to trust God even when things don't come to pass in the time when we want them to, or the way we think they should. We have to understand this about God. Man, I... I told you guys a story about Kai breaking my TV with the golf club a few weeks ago. And uh, yeah, he shattered my 50-inch uh, plasma. But I didn't tell you guys the end of the story, which was that same Sunday I told the story here at Project Church. I went home after service, after our second service. I walk in the house, and there's a brand new plasma screen TV mounted in my room, in my house. And I was like, what? and the other one was on the ground next to it. And I'm going, what, what's going on? Someone in this church had gotten or had heard and went and purchased us the TV and mounted it on the wall in our house. And I, honestly, I was blown away. I mean, I didn't know how to even feel. And I still don't know who did it. How dare you? <laughs> Reveal yourself, person. I'm going to figure it out eventually. But I, wanna, I just wanted to say that because I think that, and, and it's something I know that you guys are saying, wow, well, I mean, it's just a TV. But to me, it was just another sign of God's grace, of his provision, of his love. And not only that, but he works through the people around us, doesn't he? God wants to provide for us. He wants to meet our every need, but it doesn't always happen in our timing. It doesn't always happen when we think it should. But some of us are so obsessed with what we need, we forget, and it's actually taken away from the understanding of who God is, from the greatness of who God is, the goodness of who God is. We have to just plus, press into and get obsessed with knowing God and loving God and have a relationship with God, of trusting in God, and leave the results to Him. Because He has better plans for you than you have for yourself. He wants to give us more and, and better than we could even ask or imagine. Ephesians 3.20 tells us that. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. I'm here to tell you right now, God wants to do more for you. You think you want this? He's got even greater things for you. But you got to trust in him alone. You can't trust in your strength, in your power. You can't even trust in the things that you want from God, but you just have to trust in who he is. Because sometimes I think we sell God short because we're just asking for this, and God's saying, you're just asking for this, and I want to give you this. We need to just trust him, acknowledge who he is, and grow more in love with him. Place your trust in God alone. Number two, we have to pursue the presence of God. Pursue his presence. David says in verse number four, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. David was obsessed with pursuing the presence of God. He's like, God, I don't want anything else from you. 
I don't want you to save me. I don't want you to kill Saul. I don't want you to wipe out this army. I don't want you to make me king. There's one thing I will ask. Do you hear this? Like what David said. He said, there's one thing I'll ask. And there's one thing that I'll seek, that I may be in your presence, God. That's all I want. When we pursue the presence of God in our lives, I found that everything else falls into place. When we say, God, I want nothing more than Nothing more than your presence. I want nothing more than to trust in your presence, than to be in your presence. When we have that attitude and that heart, everything else falls into its place. The problem is we're running after all these other things, all the things we need, all the things we need God to do do for us and, and, and with us. And we need to just be saying, God, I just want to know you more. I just want to be in your presence. Because when we're in his presence, he begins to work all the other things out for us. When I was in high school, a group of my friends, um, after a Wednesday night service, I, w- I went to this youth group and went to this Wednesday night service, and I went with a group of friends. They're like, hey, we're going to go to this party at one of our friends' house, and it was like a chill party. It wasn't like a crazy party, and I was like, all right, cool, let's do it. And so on the way there, we stopped at this park, and we stopped at this park, and I'm like, what are we doing? And they're like, oh, Caleb, don't worry about it. And so we get out, and we go into the park. And then next thing I know, like, they're all pulling out different things, uh, chewing tobacco, drugs, right, Uh, smoking a little of this and that. And I didn't even know that that was what was about to go down. And so uh, at this point, I'm in high school, I've never smoked anything, I've never drank anything, I've never chewed anything. And my friends are like, Caleb, you want to, like, try some chewing tobacco? And, like, this is, to you, is, like, kind of funny, but... uh, I'm a, I think I was a junior in high school, and I was like, all right, fine, I'll try it. So I chewed tobacco for a few minutes and uh, spit it out. But I went home that night, and I just want you to understand something about me, because this has been my whole life. I've always, like, strived after the presence of God in my life. And I'm not saying this to brag, because I just want you guys to understand, like, this is uh, just something that happened in my life. But I went home that night, and I know some of you are like, well, that's not even that big of a deal, but it was a big deal to me. And the Holy Spirit convicted me so strongly, so strongly in that moment. He said, Caleb, I've created you for more than this. I've created you to set an example for the people around you. You're a leader. You're not a follower. And like the Holy Spirit is just like, bam, bam, hit me, hit me. Like literally the second I got home that night, and so, this is so corny, but I left my dad a note that morning because he left earlier than me to wake me up. My dad wakes me up, and I confess to him what I did. I'm like, Dad, I messed up. Like, and I told him, and he was like, okay, Caleb, that's fine. Like, he, he didn't even think it was a big deal. And I'm like crying, right? I'm like, Dad, I messed up, man. I chewed tobacco. It was wintergreen. I kind of liked it, you know. Like, and so I'm confessing this to him, and He's like, all right, Caleb, well, we'll think about your punishment, but um, I'll, let, I'll let you know. And so he goes to work, and he never punished me because what he saw was punishment enough. Like how broken I was over it. But I tell you that story to say this, is that I believe that because I was constantly, I mean, I read my, from when I was in junior high, I read my Bible every day. And I, to this day. I constantly sought God in my life. I was in church faithfully. I found that the presence of God, I was constantly pursuing it. It was so strong in my life that whenever I try to get off track, the Holy Spirit just slaps me. You know what I'm saying? You ever experience this? Like, whap, what are you doing, boy? Get back in line. I've got a call on your life. I've got a purpose for you. And I believe that the presence of God is that powerful for us. And some of us, we're pursuing all the wrong things. We're pursuing all this other stuff. Or we need God to do this for us. But if we just got in love and got obsessed and sought after the presence of God, then everything else would begin to fall in line. That God would say, yeah, you needed this, but i got something even greater for you. Just get in love with my presence and I'll put you exactly where you're supposed to be. We need to pursue the presence of God. What David is saying here is that when you have the presence of God, you are good in whatever circumstance. He's saying when you have the presence of God, that's all you need. It doesn't matter how hard your situation is, how tough your situation is, what you're going through is, 
that the presence of God will give you peace in that situation. When we are close to God's presence, we can't run away from our purpose. And I hope you hear this, because some of you, you haven't been close to the presence of God, you haven't been pursuing the presence of God, and then you wonder why you feel no purpose in your life. The reason you feel no purpose is because you don't have the presence. Unless you have the presence, you can't walk in the purpose that God has for you. So get obsessed, get filled up, and start seeking after the presence of God. You know how you do that? You come to church. So pat yourselves on the back right now. You guys are pursuing the presence of God by being here. You know how else you do it? In prayer. You know how else you do it? In reading the word of God, the Bible. You, know, you guys know you can open this up at home on your own throughout the week. It's crazy, right? Like you just open it up and you start reading it. And God begins to speak to you and show you things. The presence of God is what we need. When you're surrounded by the presence of God, you can face whatever the circumstances you are in through God. And so some of you are in here, you're going, Caleb, this sounds good, but you don't know what I'm going through. You know what? I don't. But God does. And his presence will bring peace and build in trust in you through that circumstance. God's presence brings sanity to our situation. Number three. Third way for us as God's people to move from fear to trust is to acknowledge your desperate need for God. David begins to cry out to God. Verse 9 through 12, I'm not going to read it all, but he's like, don't hide your face from me, God. Don't turn your servant away in anger. Don't reject me. Don't forsake me, right? He's like going through, he's like, God, don't leave me. Don't let me go. And he says, my mom and dad ab abandoned me, right? My mom and dad, my mother and father forsake me, but Lord, you got to receive me. What David is saying is he is desperate and in desperate need of God. He's desperate for God. He's saying, God, whatever you do, don't leave me. Don't abandon me. Don't forsake me. David should make you all feel better in this place because he dealt with feeling alone. And I know that every one of us in here has had that moment in our life when we felt alone. You maybe were in the middle of a group of people and you still felt alone. In the middle of a house of people, you still felt alone. In the middle of your friends, you still felt alone. He dealt with fear, David did. He felt, dealt with worry, he dealt with anxiety. I want to say, you're not alone and you're not the first. But when you understand your desperate need for God, he'll begin to infuse you with trust. He'll say, you don't have to feel alone. You can trust in me. You don't have to think that I'm going to abandon you. You can trust in me. I know your situation may seem impossible. You're saying, what do I do, God? There's nothing I can do. You can trust in me. I will not leave you or forsake you. David, after expressing his lack of fear, his trust in God alone, his longing for his presence, only shifts gears and he begins to say, God, don't leave me, don't abandon me, not like my parents. You know what we see here? There's a desperation. He just like went through and said, God, you're my stronghold, right? God, you're my defense. Like speaking out the truth of who God is over his life. But then all of a sudden he shifts gears and it's like he gets scared, Right? You have, you've maybe had these moments where, like, God, I know you got me. You got your back. And you're like, oh, God, please, seriously. Like, don't leave me. I'm serious about this. Like, this is what David does. And I love this because it just shows his humanity. It shows that he's like so many of us. And we can know all the right things to say. And those of you that grew up in the church, maybe you know all the right things to say. You know all the Christianese that you need to spout. But there comes that moment when you just got to go, God, I need, I'm desperate for you. I can't do this without you. You come to that place of understanding your need to trust in God alone. We need to get desperate. We need to get a desperation back in our lives for God. The problem is in our culture and in America that we, we're too comfortable. We're not desperate for God because we're comfortable in what we have. We're comfortable in our job. We're comfortable. I mean, look at We got these nice houses. We got heat, air conditioning in the summer, right? Heat in the winter. We, we, get, we have a nice car you probably all drove here in or whatever. We're so comfortable that we've forgotten the desperation that we must have for God. And that's why I want to say to you, I know it's hard to hear, but your struggles and your challenging circumstances are a good thing. Because they remind us and reveal to us how much we desperately need God. It gets us out of our comfort zone and says, wow, I, I can't do this on my own. Like all the things of this world aren't enough. 
I need God and God alone. And that's why the Bible in the New Testament time and time again says rejoice. Rejoice when you go through trials. Rejoice when you suffer. Rejoice when you struggle. I know it's easy to say from up here it's hard to live in your day to day life. And some of you are maybe in the middle of the struggle. You're going, Caleb, how am I going to rejoice in this? How am I going to have joy in this? I want to say to you right now, it begins to build in you trust. Trust in God that you probably never would have had. And it also begins to build in you a desperation for God. And we need to be desperate for God once again in our lives. I want to say this to you because I think that some of us have felt this and we've thought this and we've experienced this is don't interpret God's silence as God's absence. We've all had moments of God's silence in our lives, but that doesn't mean that God is absent. So I want to say to you that in those moments when you're going through a tough situation, a tough circumstance, and it feels like God is silent, I want you to hear me. God is not absent. You may feel like he is. You may say that he is. You may even say to someone else that he is. But I'm here to say to you, don't quit. Don't give up. His silence does not mean absence. His silence may be just preparing you for the victory that's coming. For the move that's about to take place. For the trust that it's building. And so we need to continue to trust even when God is silent. And I'm going to close right now with number four. The final way to move from fear to trust is to patiently wait on God. You know, I don't like patience. I don't like being patient. But I love how David closes verse number four or close to this psalm in verse number 14. He says, wait for the Lord. Say it, say it with me. Say, wait for the Lord. Say it again. Let's read it together. From wait for the Lord, the first one. Ready? One, two, three. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. I love any time in scripture it repeats things. Because that's for emphasis, right? So if you have your Bible and a pen, you should underline, wait for the Lord, and then wait for the Lord. What David is saying is, wait for the Lord, right? What David is saying is, be patient. What David is saying is, God's silence does not mean that God is absent. What David is saying is you got to be patient because you don't know what God is doing behind the scenes. You don't know what he's working even when you don't see him. You may not see it happening, but he's doing something and you can't even expect or understand or begin to comprehend what it is that he's about to move in your life. So wait for the Lord. I want to go and close with this. John chapter 11. John chapter 11 is the story of Lazarus. Maybe you've heard this story if you grew up in the church or you've been in the church for all. Maybe you haven't. But Lazarus was the one who Jesus loved. And so I want you to, to see this because in verse number 3 of chapter 11, it says, He who you love is ill. So I, I need you to hear this because Lazarus is described to Jesus with simply one phrase, he who you loved. He who you love is ill. Now that's pretty significant because they're able to describe to Jesus a man simply by saying the one who you love, not even using his name. And Jesus knows who it is. He says, he who you love is ill. And then we see in verse number six, it says, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And you need to catalog that right now in your brain. Because some of you are going, God, I'm in need. God, I'm in a struggle. God, I'm going through it. God, I'm in a trial. God, help me. God, where are you at? And you got to look here and say, wow, Jesus, when he was on the earth, in the flesh, is told, he who you love, Lazarus, you know him, you love him, like he's one of your favorites, right? 
one of your favorite people on the planet, who you love is ill, and what does Jesus do? He says he stays where he was for another couple days, just taking his time, doing his thing. Why? Because Jesus had a purpose. His silence, right, his non-action in this moment did not mean that he'd abandoned them. It didn't mean that he was absent from the situation. And you may feel like God has abandoned you, like God has left you, like God doesn't even know what's going on in your life, or he didn't care. But I want you to hear me that don't confuse God's apparent absence as apathy. He who you love is ill. Is, God, is Jesus apathetic towards Lazarus? No. He loves him. And yet, he doesn't act in this moment. And we actually see in Scripture, they're like upset with him over it. Like, Jesus, how could you do this? How could you not come running right when you heard that the person you loved is ill? How could you not act? So too many of us, we think that when God doesn't act right when we ask him to, or right when we think we need him to, that he's apathetic towards us. Or he's absent from our situation, but that's not the case. So I want to go back to the beginning. I said to you three things. I said a lot of us, when we're in these moments where we go, <coughs> what do we do when there's nothing you can do? We say, I'll never be happy again. We say, nothing good can come from this. We say, there's no point in continuing. And you know what that's talking about? It's talking about joy. I'll never be happy again. It's talking about how nothing good can come from this. Hope. It's talking about there's no point in continuing purpose. So too many of us, when we go through these things and we go, what do I do when there's nothing I can do? We come to this point and we lose our joy and we lose our hope and we lose our purpose. But I want you to see what happens in verse number 11 through 15 with Lazarus. Lazarus, can you throw this up for me? Verse 11 through 15 of John chapter 11. Maybe you don't have it. That's okay, I'll go there myself. I got a Bible right here. See, this is why you bring your Bible to church, people, because you never know. Let's read John chapter 11. Verse 11 through 15 says this. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I love that. Like Jesus told him he's fallen asleep and he was just trying to like allude to it. Maybe he was trying to be gentle about it. And they're like, what do you mean? If he's just sleeping, then he'll be fine. They're like, he's like, guys, he's dead, right? Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Let us go to him. Let us go to him. And then we see just a few verses later that Jesus goes to the tomb where Lazarus is buried and he's been buried for four days. And he calls out to Lazarus and Lazarus comes walking out of the tomb wrapped up in linens and he's alive once again. So what do you do when there's nothing you can do? You trust in Jesus. That's what I'm here to tell you today. Jesus is still there. Jesus is still moving. You may not think he is. You may think he's been apathetic. You may think he doesn't care. You may think he doesn't even know what's going on in your situation. But I want you to hear that God has a greater purpose in your situation than you even see. He's ready to bring life where you only sense death. He's ready to burst in the tomb of that situation that you're in where you feel like he's left you, where you feel like he's abandoned you, and he's about to bring that dead thing back to life. God hasn't forgotten you. God hasn't abandoned you. He loves you. He's thinking about you, and his purposes are going to be revealed through you and through your situation. So here's what I'm here to tell you today. 
What do you do when there's nothing you can do? What do you do when you're filled with fear? What do you do when you're filled with anxiety? What do you do when you're filled with worry? What do you do when you're going through a situation that feels like you're at your wit's end? You don't know how you're going to come back from this. You don't know what you're going to do. There's one thing that we can do. We trust in Jesus. Because nothing is dead when Jesus is present. Because nothing is too far gone when Jesus is there. And so I'm here to tell you today, if you don't know Jesus... You need to invite him into your life right now, right here. Because when Jesus comes into your life, he brings life where you thought there was only death. When Jesus comes into your life, he brings hope where you were hopeless. When Jesus comes into your life, he brings purpose where you felt like you were purposeless. Jesus is the only one that we can trust in. Not the things of this world. Not your own strength, not the money you have in your bank account or the lack thereof. Jesus is the only one you can trust in. So let's trust in him. Would you bow your heads with me across this place?